Dr. Fritz Pinnock. Am I right? Yes, you're right. <laughs> Good to have you on camera. My pleasure. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Great job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, listen, I have followed you. Uh, I've followed you on Facebook. I've followed you in the newspaper. And, and, and I am very happy to meet you. I, uh, we have a, a common friend and, and she has told me so much things. She has so much, so much respect for the work that you do. And, and I want to thank you for the kind of work that you're doing in, in, in logistics. I said to God, be the glory. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about you and your boyhood, man. I, I want to know which, which part you come from. St. Elizabeth. Oh, you <laughs> we, we grew up in St. Elizabeth. So, Mr. Reed and I, we are friends from boyhood days. You are kidding me. Yeah. I did not know that. So, you're from Balaclava also? No, from Silo, which is the next community. At Over. Yes. Oh, okay. So, you went to Monroe too? Yes, we both went to Monroe. Did you pass a college dressing together? Yes. <laughs> in fact, he, I was a year ahead of him. Okay. In fact, Minister had a brother, an older brother. Uh, Barrington. Class. No, it was before Barrington. Okay, okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, he passed down. Oh, yes, yes. okay. So he was in my class. Yeah. All right, so, so you carry water though, right? Y yes, man. I carry water, man. In silo. <laughs> in silo. <laughs> you didn't have the catchment though, right? Did you have the no, catchment? I didn't have the catchment. So that, that's why you had to carry water. <laughs> <laughs> what was God? So, so did you have a mom and dad in your home? Like, like, yes, yes. I grew up with my mom and dad, and in fact, my father was there. You know, and in fact, that had a great influence on me. I, I really, most of the people that we've talked to, I've seen, I've seen them being a lot more balanced out there in terms of you know what they have achieved and what they are doing in their lifetime. I, I, I really encourage, and I, I encourage people who are watching. To, to make sure that, you know, when you have a child, make sure, you know, where daddy is or, you know, and, and, and mommy, mommy and daddy can mind the home. They don't have to live together, but make sure that daddy is, is there somewhere in the life of the child, you know. Um, so, so um, did you have the donkey too and the hamper? Did, did you have to do that? I didn't have the donkey and hamper, but I admired it and my friends had it, so I enjoyed it. Oh, so what I are had some experience of it? What are some of the games that you played or some of the things that you did where, that were interesting in growing up? Was a child, you know, you had to be creative. Mm -hmm. You make your own toys. Right. It's the same thing. You used to make your own bikes with a wooden wheel, and oh. you know. So that was the fun part of it, and what what you know, you, the creativity came out of you. So innovation. You, so did that? Do you, are you seeing all that transform into who um, Dr. Fritz he is today? Most certainly. Um, the, the 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 simple values and strong things that you are taught about integrity, honesty, you know, discipline, and that was the core yes. of you know of everything. And also again, the experience both Mr. Reed and I had in going to boarding school uh -huh. made a big impact. And he didn't say it in the interview, but both of us end up in academia today, in education. And I think as a result of even the strong influence of the principal that we had, Mr. Roper. Mr. Roper, I, I wanted to ask you who his principal was. <laughs> I, I also know that Monroe had probably one of the best agricultural, um, am I right? Yes, agricultural farms, right? Yes. In, 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 in fact, it was, it was a foundational part of the program. From first form, you had to have your coveralls, mm -hmm. you had your water boots, mm -hmm. and you know everybody had to go to the farm. Every farm had a plot. Mm -hmm. We'd grow vegetables and different things, and then the school was self-sufficient in poultry, in you know, in several things, in milk, and in vegetables. And in fact, we used to sell vegetables to Hampton and, and um, Bethlehem Teachers College. So the school was run as a business. And in fact, on very prudent grounds, it's not about um, never seeing Mr. Roper complain about what we don't have. It's about using what we have um, in, in, in such a sustainable way. And his influence, his leadership, you know, had, I mean, strong impact on, you know, where we are today. You know, um, St. Elizabeth is actually the breadbasket parish. That's the most formidable agricultural parish we have in Jamaica. More certainly, especially and where the school was. That so mo it might be, so you see how I never really connected um, Monroe's um, agricultural prowess with, with, with St. Elizabeth. That, that probably is, is how it, it came about, isn't it? It is, and of course it's about um, the, the resilience which mm. came out. Um, didn't have much water. 
Wow. So in South Central, so you know the practice of mulching, mm -hmm. you know, had to be there. You know, you put the dry grass between, you know, to help absorb some of the sun. So <laughs> so, you know, just about you know how you utilize the little that you have. Yes, and, oh and I think it's one of Jamaica's challenge. It's not a lack of resources, no. It's a lack of resourcefulness. Yes, and that is what is important. Uh, this one, um, I one of the things that I saw a few months, probably about uh, nine months ago, I saw I saw you got a, um, an award. Tell us about that award. That award. <laughs> yeah, man, it's okay, you can burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say that I received that award on behalf of the team. Well, okay. it was well, it was actually to one at at Oxford uh -huh. University. It was um, what you call um, the it was a global award. Okay, that they give um, um, for twenty. They, they, they choose that they say 20 best professionals in the world. Oh. So that year I got for education and training oh. in, in the category. Okay. But um, it was by, by the Europe Business Assembly award at Oxford University. Okay. So okay. I was really shocked, you know, and I'm deeply honored to be the first guy. It was great. Let me tell you this. And that's what I was on behalf of the team. I, I figured, I figured. Um, out, of, out of watching you, I came up with a committee that's responsible for designing a global award for diaspora members. Fantastic. And, and so it will roll out at, at conferences called Fantastic. Jamaica, Jamaica um, Excellence Award for, for Diaspora and Friends of Jamaica. Fantastic. Yes, really you deserve the first one. I know, my love. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> All right, so so after you left Monroe, what, what happened? Where did you go? Well, interesting. I um, went to six form at Monroe, mm -hmm. and um, I used to be involved in a lot of sports. Mm -hmm. I was on the football team, mm -hmm. track and field team, hockey team, you know, so many teams, but there was a little secret to it. Um, Monroe was like a prison. <laughs> 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 They chose the journalist or the team that to take you out. He's not one still you know, I joined the choir. <laughs> Just to get out. No, and in fact we did get out. We went to Black River. And yes. so there was a there was a whole um, competition of choirs. Yes. So we were one of two high schools in there. Stets was in the other Stets one. The, other one yeah. the Mono came and said, ah well Mono, we're not ready. But the entire football team joined the choir, but we went for the lunch. <laughs> So during the competition, you know, we're up against some primary school and basic school, yes. and we came dead last. What? <laughs> <laughs> because well, some of us knew our limits. We couldn't sing, so yeah. we had to <laughs> sing. But this guy, you know, decided got carried away and he said, "Sing up!" and he started to sing and didn't realize. And you know, of course, when we went back, the music teacher was very upset and annoyed. He was from Scotland and he decided to do an audition. So before he could get to me, I had some permission to go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the end of my music career. <laughs> it was a long live one. So. But then I got the lunch. <laughs> Alright, so you left sixth form and you yeah, went to... I left sixth form and then I got two football scholarships at the time. Oh. One was to go to University of Georgia. No, it was Georgia State University to do medicine and um, pre-med. And then I got one to go to Russia. Oh. My mother started to cry the time. Yes, Russia. Oh, boy, boy, I went to a communist. So that's how I went through the window. Yes, yes, yes. And by the time they sent my I-20 form, mm -hmm. it was a week late. So they asked me to, uh, re, to enter the January. So that was the August, I said. No. So what I did, I went off to Canada for okay, a year. Okay. And um, living in Edmonton, Calgary, very cold. and. I had an experience, I said, boy, you know, I think I want to go and help to build Jamaica. Oh. So I went back and I worked at Mutual Life for a year. That was an interesting year. Hmm. Because when I went in, I decided I was so hungry to learn that I was put in the accounting department and I would stay back in the evening to try to learn everybody's desk. Which, which, which branch was this? In Kingston? Yes, this was okay. the head office. Of in Mutual the head office, right. of, yes, okay. So now the NCB Towers. Yes. So while I was there, you know, you go through a lot and then I learned a lot. Uh, then I, after two months, I was doing my supervisor's report. <laughs> and people start to laugh, hey, why are you doing this? But then I realized it was that driving me, you yes, know? Yes. And uh, before long, I could do everybody's desk in the department. Then I decided to go and study 
I applied to UE, I got through, and then, you know, the company said, anytime you want to come back, we'll have something here for you. So in the summer, first summer, I went back and I worked and, you know, so that was it. Then I ended up at UWI and I was doing economics and accounting, oh. management studies. And in close to my final, I said, but this is just not me. Okay. Probably I'm too energetic and hyperactive for accounts. For accounts. <laughs> so I was going through the motions and um, close to my exam period, final exam. I was so busy getting interviews while my friends are forgot that I needed one. But I just decided, I said, no, I don't think the banks are for me. So three months before my final exams, I met this young lady, very tall, elegant young lady. I was so impressed with her. She told me she worked in the maritime industry. I said, maritime, what's that? Mm -hmm. I didn't learn anything about it. Yes. Then she would tell me about her travels and what she did and how exciting her job was. No two days were the same. And I said, well, that's like something I'd like to do. But anyway, the end of the end of that and exams passed, then I realized a month or two I did not have an interview in the job. My friends were working oh. as a so I remember she told me she worked at this company, Lana and Amor Shipping. Mm -hmm. So I looked in the telephone directory, phone the number, and I called this day. I just took up the phone and then I said, Good morning, madam. This lady answered the phone. I said, May I speak to Mr. Vance Lanham? She said, Who is calling? She said, Tell him it's Fritz Spinner, because if you should know who. <laughs> the lady said, Who? Fritz what? I said, Fritz Spinner. And Mr. Lanham came on the phone. He said, How may I help you, sir? I said, Well, Mr. Lanham, I'd like to meet with you because I have a very interesting proposal how to improve the bottom line of your company. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like this man. I said, What? So he said, um, How about next week? Tuesday at 9 o'clock. I said, let me check my diary. Leah never owned a diary. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, sir, 9 o'clock is fine. So I make sure I take the bus for a seven. The bus! The bus! <laughs> so I cool off, you know. You know. And I had a briefcase, you know. Yes. I said, Chuck, you know, I may have a briefcase, but not barrel. <laughs> but I never have nothing in the briefcase. <laughs> so I sat in the lobby, put my tie together, and sat down very neatly. So. He said, Mr. Lanham, I'd like to see you now. So now I walk in this big intimidating office, a lot of crystals and different things around. And I walk right up and I remember my few basic interviewing skills. Look him in the eye, give him a firm handshake. <laughs> and a firm handshake. Sit down and say, he said, yes, what can I do for you? I said, sir, I'm here to offer my services to you. Oh! <laughs> so the man said, what? So the man, he start one laugh. And he laughed, he laughed, he laughed, he laughed, he laughed, he laughed. He said, I've never seen this before. So what you say? And I said, I said, if I'm going out, I'm going out confidently. I said, I'm going to offer my services to you. <laughs> and I said, I'm calling partner. It was Lanaman and Morris. Lanaman and Morris. Everyone is Morris now. Buddy, I'm a young man and I don't know if he need a mother in boot. What between the two, but I think we should see him. And I was coming in. So I said, said um, and talk and he said, Wednesday, and he said, All right, Thursday, 11, can work for you. So he said, Turn around and said to me, How about Thursday? Look, I said, Just let me check my name, open the briefcase and back to him. Can't say anything. He said, Thursday, um, yes, yes, I could do this. Yes, sir, I'll be here. Lock it back in. I briefcase and I went out. Came back Thursday, similar routine, come early, cool off of the bus. I wait. You cannot see that on the car. I went to the animal and said, The boat went to the boat. I was tired walking and started to laugh. So I would not be thrown off by this. I looked very confident. Went in and gave him a shrug and shake, sit down. He said, so, so what can I do for you now? He asked me. He said, I am here to offer my services to improve the bottom line of your company. Right. right. Now the two of them start to laugh. <laughs> and I'm laughing, I'm laughing, I'm laughing. Anyway, when they were finished, they said, they asked me to step out a little. So I said, well, they might run me, but my husband. And <laughs> when they say, you know what? We have never seen this before. We don't have a position, but we decide to create one. <laughs> so we're going to offer the position as manager of special projects for the group. So we have fifty million dollars to invest, and you're gonna tell us how to invest that? Oh my Can God! Can you do that? And if you lose it, you know. I say most certainly, Mr. Norman, we, uh, Mr. Morris. Thank you for the confidence and the opportunity. Your company will now move from strength to strength, sir. And he came around, showed me where I'm gonna be and everything, and said, "Listen, you have to write your own proposal. This is new. It's all in your hands." I said, "No problem," and I left. I shook his hand. I went to UWA. Went back to one of my former lecturers. Yes. And in fact, who was a minister of the previous administration, Dr. Omar Davis. Omar Davis. And he used to. He can help. Yes, he was uh, <laughs> at the time my econ statistics teacher, lecturer. 
sat me down for about four hours and he took the time and went through with me. And when I was finished, I said, you know what? A lot more has to be covered with prayer. So I went and decided and without, I, I, it was just like learning from the ground, hit and miss. Oh, and I must say that the projects that I did, all of them were very successful and transformational. Wow. In fact, the company made money, but after nine months there, I remember I got a call one afternoon. And someone said, hello, Fritz. I said, Fritz Pinnock? I said, yes. I said, this is Paco Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy from France. I said, yes, sir. I said, yes, sir. What can I do? He said, come and see me tomorrow at 5.30 in the <laughs> office. This was a competition. You know. Yes. Her Grace was the biggest in the Great. transportation yeah. division at the time. I said, Mr. Kennedy, you want to see me? Why Mr. Kennedy, you want to see me? So I went over there the afternoon, sat in his office, and he was talking about two of his other directors were there. Knock out this office and put Fritz's office beside mine here. And, you know, just like that? Just like that. And I sat down and I said, so I was very confused and puzzled. Wonder mm -hmm. why, why I was there now. So he said, why well, you look like that, Fritz? I said, well, Mr. Kennedy, I'm, I'm a little bit off. I don't know. You're not here to me. He said, well, you're coming to work for me. <laughs> so I said, I sat down and I said, what? These people have been so good to me. So Landerman took me in I'm on a path for right. succession planning. Right. No, he bought me a car, everything, you know, the job wow. looking after me there and everything. Wow. So I sat down and I said, Wow, well, how can I tell Mr. Kennedy I'm, I'm not looking at job and how would I tell him I don't want to come? Yes. The long and short of it anyway is that he said, By the way, Fritz, how much money you want to earn for next year? This was like the December. I said, this is an opportunity. Just give him some ridiculous figure. And that will run him. Yes. So I took my salary and I multiplied by five. <laughs> I said, Mr. I said, he just turned to his finance director and said, Freddie, top it up now. Give him a job. So I said, wow, that did not work. <laughs> so I said, what am I going to do now? So I said, how oh, you look, still look so puzzled. I said, well, Mr. Kennedy, it's not just about money. It's about opportunity. These people have been good to me and everything. And he bought me a car and said, how much money you loaned me to buy the car? I just took out his check and would go and pay them off. I lend you money to buy a new car. And I said, well, how do I get out of this one? I said, well, Mr. Kennedy, one more thing, sir. Well, I said, I, you know, if you could give me a little to think about it, and not just that, but also I'd have to leave properly to give due notice and everything. I said, well, I can understand and I appreciate and respect that. And I left and I thought and I said, wow going to take the job because Grace offered more opportunities but here's a then I the night was the, the following day was the birth was the Christmas function right and I planned the function oh and there's a lot of us talking and introducing <laughs> me as if, and I had my resignation <laughs> for about a week before we get the name and I can tell you this it was really a moment I don't want to remember when I gave it to him it was heartbroken oh I said, please, um, this is a career move and I really respect and appreciate everything and, you know, well, the long and, well, you know, after, he was really mad with me, but after about two years, started talking again, still was my mentor and, you know, he, he died earlier this year. And I can tell you, this was a man, a great man, a man with a vision, Mr. Lanaman, I've learned so much from him. Anyway. That, the other chapter of my life was going to Grace Kennedy and I remember I got a scholarship and um, one of the big scholarships from the UN to go to London School of Economics to study. Okay. So I can say, no you're not going this year. Next year, if you apply for a scholarship, don't get it, don't worry, I'll send you. And the following year, I didn't remember to apply for the scholarship. but. I applied for University of Plymouth. I wanted me to do some to do international shipping, and I added logistics. That is back in 1989. Oh my gosh! And Grace Kennedy paid everything for me to go. Looked after me well, paid my salary, and I mean now they spent at the time over forty thousand pounds. I mean 1989. So I came back with that sort of passion that I need to give back and bring back this opportunity to you know to give many more Jamaicans who could not experience that. So. Had some lovely years at Grace Kennedy. So how long did you spend at Grace Kennedy? I was there for quite a few years, uh, probably over ten years. Okay. Ten years, and then I left, and I went to, to Zim. Zim offered me a job, Zim Shipping Line, to set up a company for them, which I set up, managed, until it came off the chart. It was doing so so well. Oh my! And then God. that was it, and I went back to London. 
after that as well. Oh, you went back to Lamwell? After okay. as well, vice director and you okay. know, my role was to help to improve the company by 50%. The company, in three years, the company improved by over 1,000% in three years. Lamwell is the, is the one that, that made ICB and then so No, like that. no, that was a ocean. relative of the That's a relative? Lamwell and Mars Shipping, it managed the Ocho Rescue Ship oh. Terminal. Evergreen shipping line, Carnival cruise lines. Oh, okay, yeah, so a big okay, line, yeah, so okay. A big integrated group. So mm -hmm. you know, then the company did so well. So then I wanted another challenge. Mm -hmm. Then I decided after that now to go to the Caribbean at the Institute at the time. This was in 2006. After the fourth attempt, the fourth um, attempt by the chairman then to recruit me. And I said no the three times before, then he came back the fourth time to say to me that they made an advertise in the UK, in Jamaica. They were looking for somebody with a mix of experiences and that they wanted, that solid background in shipping and so on. So after I said, let me consider it. Then when I saw the state of where things was, it was really a challenge mm -hmm. to go in and to do a transformational job. So that was a challenge. So when I went in in 2006, we had under 300 students. Now we have 4,500 students. Ooh, wow! So we had two programs. Now we have probably in the applied, well, in the what they call the customized courses, we have close to 200 of those now. We have over 15 bachelor's degrees, master's C degrees. Customized? When you say customized, that means that person can come in and do various mixtures of classes to how, how that's you? part of it also you know, we go into industry into companies and look at their problems and create a program for ah students. got it got so, it okay i've done a lot of that so yeah. that was quite a, an amazing thing that you did back in 1989 to add logistics to your class to your, to your core class and i was telling everybody i said this is the future people are laughing at me what do logistics what's that I said, well, it doesn't matter of time, the Panama Canal is going to outgo itself. You, you said that then? At then. So it was a vision and a dream I've been carrying over 20 odd years before. It so it, 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 it's fully in place now? I mean. So uh, it, it was really a passion coming to life, seeing something. So this is not, this is something I believe in. I've, you know, it was the writing was on the wall from a long time and is is one of Jamaica's greatest opportunities. Tell us about the, the logistics hub and what, what how, how do you uh, facilitate? Well, the logistics hub is a concept of development and it's not a place. Right. It's about, well, how Jamaica's economy has been over the last 20 years. I mean, we, we borrow money to live a life that we cannot afford. That's right. basically what we do. You know, we, we'll import so much, mm -hmm. we'll talk a lot, but we do very little in terms of implementation. Yes. So after a while, when our GDP, debt to GDP ratio got so high, the debt outstripped the GDP. Mm -hmm. All the international agencies came together and said, listen, we'll not lend you any more money. You have to come and tell us how you're gonna get out of this problem. So we choose some nice fancy terms like, you know, I mean, agro-processing, we're gonna do all of these things. <laughs> and they said, oh, those are good, but can I, you need something transformational. And I remember at the time it was then Dr. Eric Deans. Yes, I remember that. That's the period face. Right, period, right, right. Okay. And you know, he wrote the, the, the initial little strategy mm -hmm. of how Jamaica can use it, the concept of using the economy by our virtue of our location to attract other industries to come to cluster, right. to, to add value. Right. So that is the context of the logistics. So. So I got involved with him and then together we'll do a lot of development and then there was a task force created so I became in charge of education and training. Mm -hmm. And of course... So we, we're brothers now, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Senator Reed was the first one who bought in the idea of oh. the high school sector, so JC and ourselves, Simon MOU. So, you know, he shared the vision and he's passionate about it. So. It's about transforming Jamaica's economy from choosing our neighbors, choosing the nice things we like to do, to know how can we open our shores for co companies to come in, operators offshore companies, but add value, right? Add value to Jamaica, right? So it creates, mm -hmm. you know, it circulates money through the economy, it creates job opportunities, and it provides an artificial exports going on. Mm -hmm. Because the central context to this is that the global meltdown in 2008, with the financial crisis, mm -hmm. What happened? The Panama Canal became expensive. That was expensive by virtue of the toll. 
But shipping lines were actually, the Panama Canal, the easiest way to see it is a toll road. Mm -hmm. So, and I use a simple example right. in the logistics one on one training I do, is that if you are going from one point to another point, and you have 10 passengers here, you're running a, a taxi service, you have mm -hmm. 10 passengers, and they're each paying a dollar. So you collect $10, but you have to go to a toll road. Right. And the toll road is $5, $5 for the toll. Right. So you collect $10, you pay $5 on the toll, and you go to the end. Coming back, you have only one passenger going in the opposite direction. When you reach the toll, you still have to pay $5. Right. Uh -huh. But you collect only $1 and you right. go back. I said, it's exactly what is happening to the shipping lines. Uh -huh. they, come to the, they want to get to the U.S. or to the U.S. East Coast, South Coast, you know, right down to South America. Jamaica's location, the ships would come through Panama Canal. Right. So coming in, they take ten, they collect ten dollars, so to speak. Right. Coming in of cargo, going back only one, well, one yes. export, one container for export. So they go back and still have to pay the five dollars. So they say no, you have to give me a better value proposition. So the whole idea of the logistics hub is to invite. It's, it's centered around what you call special economic zones, which are the old style free zone now being right. modernized. Right. So these zones will now bring, invite a major company to come and other small companies that will now supply them with services will come cluster around. Come cluster, yes. So yes. that whole cluster create an industry. Ah, and that industry will provide jobs some and jobs, right? So that's the context. <laughs> so, in fact, what you're seeing now in the business process outsourcing and all of that now coming to Jamaica, that's part of value. Part of it, yes, yes. So people are now arguing, oh, is this opposite to this or in, in you know in conflict with it's not the right. two is, is is the lower end of the value added process mm -hmm. by doing this in other words you'll take over the for example the one eight hundred service instead of you having operators here or you're going to a Wendy's for example and somebody the drive through the center maybe in Jamaica. Right. Somebody's calling well you provide that service because our labor rate is low. No but still attractive for us to make money. That's right. So okay. that's the whole context. Right. So is still alive. We have done a lot of work in the legislative process. You know, now the whole context is how can we make our seaport and airport attractive and now integrate. So the normal Mali airport is of a divestment, but it, it, it cannot take us into the future. I still believe we need a vernal field. <laughs> I see we need a transformation, a transformational project. But you know, we have to get and investors are there. I hope you can know. explain to 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 them what Vernon Field is. <laughs> right. Well, Vernon Field is a is a old airstrip. It was a U.S. airbase, right. chosen in, after World War II, that they used to refuel right. a lot of the American yes. service, a lot of the American come down and land air, and refuel right, and air, air fleet. Yes. But it was chosen as the most ideal airport location in the Caribbean, right, right in the center of Jamaica. Right. But around it, it's about six thousand acres of land. Right. And you have additional land. You have you have two, three runways there you now. And you know, it, it is a right, what they call a greenfield project. Right. That you could now build a proper airport for cargo. Let me stress this. Because um, Norman Manley and Sangster Airport, the two airports in Kingston and Sangster in Montego Bay, they are at capacity. They were not designed for passenger, right. for, for cargo. Right. Cargo is what makes money. Yes. Cargo, if we have right now the whole um, Southeast Asian market looking for a center for cargo, for cargo mm -hmm. outside of even the United States because of the hassle that they get to come in. Yes. But looking for alternatives that may be more cost effective for yes. them, and Jamaica could offer that opportunity. Yes. So it's about if we could attract these cargo planes coming over time, of course, the, the passengers would come. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's about how can we value add, yes. provide yes. value added opportunities for, you know, because now let me explain the value added. The, the world is no longer looking just to buy things and sell to one market. It's about because nobody's buying the same thing anymore. Right. After Henry Ford made the, 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 the car, he said you can have any color model that you want as long as it is black. <laughs> that's also how it came off the production line. Yes. But now we are in a world of mass customization. Right. If you have a thousand customers and a thousand of them need something slightly different, we may be selling a thousand jeans. But I may want a complete hole in the bottom. You yes. may want three holes. Yes. You want the legs. Yes. You want the knee all cut out. Yes. So everybody, how do you not customize? So in other words, it's no longer buying things in China and shipping everything to the US. For example, 
umbrellas, and I use this in the case. If you are selling umbrellas to JCP and you can get 1 million umbrellas, for example, in a container. If I put 1 million umbrella in green and ship them out, JCP and you have a summer style that they don't want 300,000 pink. What you do? You're going to discount them. Mm -hmm. Then you dump the rest in Marshalls and so on. And that is how they, but that model is not sustainable. But what they do, for example, is move the million umbrellas into Jamaica in a special economic zone, but they carry them in white. Right. Because you don't know what color they're going to want. Mm -hmm. So JC Penny said, now we need 300,000 in pink, hot pink. We need a wooden handle on it. We need a clear plastic with clear bag. We need a, a blue string on there. And we need a um, different animal shape on it. So to dye the umbrella, you charge extra for that. That's value added. To put on the wooden handle, that's valid. Mm -hmm. To put it in the bag, but all that is being done in Jamaica. All of that would not so, be done in Jamaica. <laughs> and then now you air freight it, and in four good. hours' time, it's yeah. back, backing up in JC Penny, New York, and you don't have to store it because logistics is not about storing Story. things, it's about moving, it's about moving things. <laughs> yes. And the, the extra value are the charge five cents, ten cents. Yes. That's your making it. That's exactly right. Ah, yeah. that's so that's the context of using the economy to add value. How did you move from 300? students to 4,000 in what, eight years, 10 years? How, how do you do that? What, 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 what happened? Well, we, do, we did just what the market was not doing. Because we're still very traditional with education and, uh, and you know, what we did was to look at the market where the needs are, work backwards and created the courses. Mm. So that's why you get customized. Yes. Because you can go from <coughs> company to company, do a, an, 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 an analysis of what they have and say, okay, this is what you need. And then you combine. <clears throat> and also the degrees that we offer. Yeah. We look at, we, we take the degrees. Because the market is asking for people with more discipline. So all our full-time students wear uniform. Three strikes of the dress code, they're out of the school. So it's about the whole transformational product. Okay. And in fact, I said to people, if you take a man with a bad attitude and give him a degree, you get an uncontrollable human being. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about how can you work? <laughs> put people out with better attitude. So this is what we are more focused on, the attitude, you know, the, the competence and the skills of today's society. It's not about a degree. If I give you a degree in general management, are you equipped to go and manage a company? After first, equip with the mindset that you need to start at the bottom. You need to learn the rules of the game, and over time you may become a general manager. Mm -hmm. So people are now hiring people because they want people with skills and competence, not necessarily people qualification. Mm -hmm. So within our degrees, we have, within our degrees, we have several skills that you'll get. Pull out certificates that are now industry professional certificates. For example, we have several logistics based degrees, and all of them are accredited by the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport in the UK. So when you finish these degrees, you become a member of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, a professional body. So people start recognizing as a professional. And that is what will help you to get your job. Oh. And the degree is now for your, your own. So, you know, it's about you do an engineering degree, but you have certificates in professional welding, in different things. So, you have skills that you can use. A man say, What can you do? You say, Yes, I can do this, I can do that. That will get you the job. So, so, so that, is the, that is the approach that we take. So, how can um, we've had several members of the diaspora moving down to Jamaica to go on courses at uni and probably you take? Are you looking into that also? Are you accredited? In Most people? certainly, in fact, we have far more accreditation at it. We have the University Council of Jamaica accreditation. We have the, as I said, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. We are the only tertiary institution in the Caribbean to be ISO 9001 2050 certified. We have institutional accreditation from Association of International Universities and Colleges out of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, our it's like what we do, we train our students, when you finish our certificate, we give you a Jamaican dollar. But beside that, put a US dollar. Ah, so the US dollar can take you anywhere in the world to work. So we prepare people for the global market, not just for the Jamaican space. Mm -hmm. Plus we look at cutting edge skills and where, where the market is going. In fact, Minister Reed, his daughter, is a third year student. Oh. The Caribbean American University. Okay, okay. And the Minister of Education had choices. He went to <laughs> and his son is looking to come and join the school in September. <laughs> <laughs> I say this to you that we have a, a new product because 
you can't keep doing it. Madness is doing the same thing on a different day and expecting different results. Mm -hmm. So there's a transformation, a shift in the education and training space. And this is what we are catering for. How to add new value. In fact, um, engineering is something that we have now transformed totally. And you may say maritime. But if you look, there's no longer any total strict maritime industry. If you ship your cargo, let's say from China, the cargo may travel over road in a container, may go on a train to go to the port, then it goes to the port and a ship it comes here from Long Beach, may go on the road again by truck and a rail. That is what you call intermodal or multimodal transport. And some part of it may end up by air. So the modes of transport have now integrated. The lines between air, sea and land have now dissipated. Mm -hmm. So our train have followed the same line. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, how, how, how do you find uh, your, your faculty? Your, your, how do you find it, um, with, with such massive growth and, and you're such a specific uh, um, school? How do, how do you find staff to fill the teaching needs? And that's always a challenge. So okay. what we also have to do, we now have to, we're looking at our programs, we're taking back the best students and we put them through the program <laughs> and, you know, developing them, giving them scholarships to, you know, to, with us and send some of them abroad and so on. And this is what you have to go in our faculty. For example, even in the seafaring program, as minister spoke to the shortage. I mean, right now, I have an officer, I need a captain or chief engineer. These guys may be earning 20,000, 25,000 US a month. Some say these are high paying careers. It is. So, you know, they're, they're, they're earning these sums of money a month. We can't keep them. So, much. so we have to work a relationship with some of these lines. I said to them, listen, we're in partnership. So I'm going to ask you for this person for four months during this four months. Give them their leave period for this month. They come and teach and they go back to see another one come to the, the other semester. And so we have to use creative means like that. But we do have some committed people who come and stay with us. So it's a challenge also because the industries are, in, you know, the, the jobs are in so much demand. And I want to say that there's a shift. And I use a classic example. There's a young man who went to Monu and I went there to do a mentorship program. And he was not in my mentorship group, but he just decided he wanted to come. He was an under-15 cricketer for the West Indies at the time, bright young man, was doing very well. And he, at that stage, he wanted to go to, to another institution, I want to go to UA to do civil engineering. Anyway, you know, they started to expose him, he came about twice to the school, he came with me on several, you know, we go to deliver several talks over there and so on. And eventually, one day he announced that he wanted to come to see, to see mm -hmm. my I said, no, give it that. So he went back to his home and his, his family was quite upset and annoyed. No, you don't think you should do this. He lived, you know, with an extended family several houses in the same property and one of his cousins was doing medicine another cousin was doing law one was doing mass communication and one was doing accounting and they all laughed at him and he decided to come he finished his course he's now an officer second officer on board a ship in brazil he has to be paying back the student loan for his cousin who completed his medical degree <laughs> He's paying back the student loan for his cousin-in-law. He bought his parents a home. He has a brand new car, opening up business in Brazil, now married a Brazilian girl, and doing very well. And he's now just 26 years old. Wow. So I'm just saying that, you know, gone are the days that, yes. you know, that, that, you know, we tend to look down and know the world, the new emerging skills are what we have to look at. What, 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 what would you need or do you need any, any, um, infusion from the diaspora members? Oh, most definitely. I have a few, you know, what you call committed diaspora members. One of them, and I'd highlight her, she's Erica Simmons. She works at Siemens, which is one of the largest engineering company in the world. She's a senior manager. And she's so committed and, you know, I've been a pumped a lot of support into us. And believe me, that link is very strong. We're looking for diaspora members to Come take your place. You want to make a change in Jamaica, do it through education yes. and training. And this is one of the institutions on the rise, where the fastest growing tertiary institution, not just in, the, in the Jamaica, but in the whole Caribbean. We have the highest rate of placement of graduates into jobs after graduation, 89%. While the average for the other universities is hovering around 40%. Wow. So I'm saying this is a place to put your money. We take discipline into account. You know, I mean, now several members of the diaspora are sending their kids there. Oh. 
you know, because we have a boarding facility and it's a good place to give them a good foundation. I say to you, Jamaica is the right place for them to do a good first degree and they can come back to the US, you save a lot of money. Yes. You're going to pay 6,000 US dollars a year versus 40,000 or 50,000 and believe me, you're getting a world class you know, um, yes. education. We're looking forward to the greater support from the diaspora and there's a place for you. We're looking for diaspora members to be part of a faculty. Come and share your experiences. You know, we can work something out in terms of you getting involved and so on. So there's tremendous work to be done. And Jamaica is still a good spot. <laughs> and I believe there's a lot of future for Jamaica in the logistics industry. Are you going to be in uh, the diaspora conference this year, 20, July 23rd to 26th? Yes, certainly. I'll be, I will be. think I've, they have confirmed me for one of the panels or something. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to You'll be speaking also. I will be speaking there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My friend. Thank you so much for Thank you, me. thank you. My pleasure. It's been such a nice, wonderful opportunity to hear you speak. And it's, uh, it's been great. Thank you very much. And uh, this is Leo Gilling uh, with uh, Dr. Fitzpinock coming to you from the Sawgrass Mills Mall right here in South Florida. Thank you very much. Thank you.